Alrighty, my Jewel 2D, here we go. Um, this, is, this will actually be the last lecture in Module 1. Um, so, you know, hopefully now you're getting a good sense of how this course is going to go. We'll have these videos that are anywhere from, you know, 15 minutes to 30 minutes. Uh, in this case, four of those videos. Um, but it could be anywhere from four to eight, uh, depending on how small the chunks are for a given chapter. I had a couple of larger chunks here, a couple of 30 minute ones. I'm gonna try not, I'm gonna try to do less of that. I'm gonna try to keep them more in the 15 to 20, uh, but sometimes the material just kind of demands um, a certain point of, of stopping. All right, so this is the fourth video and, and it corresponds to the end of chapter two. I apologize, I should have done a better job when I started module 2C of saying we were transitioning to chapter two. So module 2C is chapter two, as is this one. Okay, so let's get in here and just wrap up um, chapter two then. So here we are. Module D, um, as you'll see, it's Aristotle, Averroes, and Aquinas. A's are wild today. Okay, so we're just going to talk about these three figures and the influence they have. However, just before talking about those three figures, I want to kind of make a transition from the previous lecture and just talk about something um, that's sort of in between these two parts, okay? And that's th these things. Um, this idea of a what we're going to call a circumplex. Um, models that somehow try to capture psychologically relevant things in circular type diagrams. Now this is introduced in the chapter in the context of I Ching. Um, I had trouble uh, with I Ching. I had trouble understanding um, the whole sense of what it was supposed to represent. Um, I, I know it is used to um, you know, make predictions and stuff within the Chinese culture. I'm, this is one of these cases where, again, I'm hoping somebody will uh, come to office hours next week. And by the way, um, next week Monday is a long weekend, and that's normally when we have office hours, so next week I'll move them till Wednesday, but I'll have that. I'll have an announcement about that. So if you understand the I Ching well and you're willing to take a little bit of time introduce, you know, teaching us, um, I would love to learn more. Uh, the only critical thing I'm going to say about it is one idea of the I Ching is that you could take um, the ideas represented it in it and represent it in this circle. Uh, and things in this circle meant something. Now, they didn't mean a whole lot to me, again, because I think it was too surface of a, of a description, but the one on the right makes a whole lot more sense to me. So what we have on the right um, is... is uh, the modern reinterpretation of what was originally Galen's, so Galen had his um, uh, notion that a person's personality um, might reflect literally the fluids in the body, how much bile, how much blood, etc. Uh, and he came up with these four kinds of personality types. So he just had the ones that we see on the edges here, melancholic versus choleric versus phlegmatic versus sanguine. So just to give you an idea, sanguine, that refers, refers to the blood. And the idea is that people who had a lot of blood had a lot of passion and energy, right? Um, uh, where, whereas other things like phlegmatic, these people have a lot of phlegm. Um, and, and they're seen as a little bit more... Um, Oh, I don't know. It's hard to describe a phlegmatic personality, but you'll get a sense here. So what other people have done is they've taken these ideas that Galen normally said, and they said, well, you know what? We can, we can represent them in a different way and add to them. So they said, let's first of all, let's look at this X in the middle. Let's imagine we take these four things and we think about how non-emotional or emotional. So melancholic people and choleric people are considered to be much more emotional. Um, so you're seeing things like hot-headed, egocentric for choleric, or unhappy, worried. So this is a more negative kind of emotion, right? Uh, maybe. Um, this is maybe a more aggressive kind of emotion. Of a, we could call it that sort of way. Um, but if we imagine emotional versus non-emotional personalities and then changeable versus unchangeable. So how sort of stable is, the, is a person or how changeable are they? Um, and so... Uh, if you kind of have this way of doing things and now you throw it into a circle, you can actually extend this and say, okay, let's look at um, these sort of changeable emotions, uh, uh, personality types, 
but let's think of them in terms of the more emotional ones and the less emotional ones and how would they kind of um, flesh out and etc with them with the changeable we can do the more emotional changeable so we have worried people that are changing all the time they're, they're worried about different things all the time etc whereas a calm person isn't very changing right um, so, so they're relatively unchangeable whereas if we move up this circle from calm um, you know reasonable these are all unchangeable kind of like a reasonable person is a reasonable person a highly principled person is a highly principled person whereas a playful person might be playful in some situations and not in the other sociable in some situations or not in the other so these are much more changeable sort of personality traits these are much more stable for lack of a better term anyway big story behind this is not that I really want you to know this and all this detail but starting with the I Ching there was this notion that sometimes we can represent psychological things like a person's personality using one of these what are going to be called circumplex models circular models um, and you're going to see them coming in and out uh, as we go through various historical theories so just wanted to associate those um, with the I Ching um, so that we kind of see that's where these these came from okay fine let's get to the the mighty A's then shall we starting with Aristotle okay um, so I should have been giving you dates even before um, I, I just I'll, I'll be better with that so from now on we'll continue to have some dates so we have a sense of when we're talking and so with Aristotle we're still before Christ right it's it's still 384 to 323 BC um, so ancient let's say uh, he was Aristotle was uh, Plato's student um, and he um, you know, learned a lot from him, but also took some of uh, his ideas a different way and then had some of ideas of his own. So first of all, that whole notion Plato had of perfect forms that we talked about a lot in the last lecture, Aristotle didn't buy it. He, he didn't get, he didn't have this notion that somewhere there existed a perfect form, but that what we were seeing were imperfect forms as they're sort of instantiated in, in matter or something like that. Aristotle thought form and matter were, were totally intertwined um, and that you couldn't really have one without the other, that, that matter defined the form and the form defined the matter to some extent. Um, and so, he, you know, he kind of felt what's out there is what's out there and it's a combination of form and matter and didn't really buy this idea that perfect forms exist somewhere. Now, you know, there is a question of how literally you take um, Plato's ideas of perfect forms. Um, you know, whether you imagine, for example, I talked about attractiveness and, you know, is there some idea of the average person, the average male or the average female, does that exist in your head somewhere that what, what some people would call a stereotype, uh, of all the people that, that you've met or, you know, just a perfect blending like those images we saw, um, do they exist in your head or not? Well, this is an issue and you will see in some perception, um, uh, theories there there is a, a place for that um, stereotype and 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 the, and the thing it's also called a prototype right the prototype the average version and and the role it may play in helping us perceive things so we got a bit of a debate here with Plato and Aristotle and we're gonna have a debate we're gonna have lots of debates um, through science but this is an example of one now here's one we're gonna play off a little bit in this in this um, lecture Aristotle also started to think about life and the variance thereof um, and so first of all he said you know the difference between a dead person and a living person is the possession of a soul um, you know very common kind of uh, belief but but he explicitly said that the soul is what gives something life but he also said life can take different forms and they are qualitatively different so he talked about the distinction between plants animals and humans and he said they're all alive which I guess means they all possess a soul in his in his perspective. Um, I would I would love to hear him directly ask that question, but I assume from what I've read he would say yes. Um, but very different kinds of life and and maybe very different kinds of souls. So he said plants they grow they get bigger over time. You give them nutrition and they continue to grow and they will continue to grow as long as they have access to uh, nutrition. So that's the sort of lowest form of life, is a life that just seeks out nutrition in order to become larger. And that he thought plants fit into. Animals, he thought, had an additional power that plants do not. He thought they had the power to sense the external world. 
Um, and so he, he talked a lot about senses actually and kind of defined the human senses um, and said, you know, every, it's so, it's so well known that these are the five human senses that, that we can refer to them as common sense or something. So he even came up with the notion of common sense, um, which is something pretty cool, I would say, if you define that notion. Um, but of course, often we know common sense isn't that common, <laughs> um, but still the idea is kind of cool. So he talked a lot about sensation and that process, and he felt animals could do that. They could sense their external world. Um, and, and that was what made them different from plants, he thought. Humans, he thought, could do what the, the other two things, right? Grow with nutrition, sense the external world, but they also had the power of reason, which Aristotle thought animals did not. Um, now you've probably already imagining some debates in your head that, you know, have, I have shown you things in intro psych suggesting that some animals have some pretty powerful capabilities. Um, but, you know, to him, they did not reason, they did not think about things deeply. That was a uniquely human thing. Um, and, and reason was big to Aristotle. So the textbook will go through and, and talk about syllogisms, which he came up with, logical syllogisms. And it'll tell you, um, you know, he thought these were great because humans could solve these. Humans could figure these out. Um, and, and he didn't imagine any other animal being able to do anything of the sort. Um, you know, the funny thing is I sometimes give talks to judges about decision making and reasoning. And one of the things I ask them to do is, is solve um, some syllogisms. And it's amazing how easy it is to trick them, judges, who, whose job it is to be rational, to be reasonable, to be non-biased. They have trouble with syllogism sometimes. So I'm not always so sure that, that humans have such powerful reason as Aristotle thinks, but they, that they have the ability to reason. We have the ability to reason. It's not necessarily natural or easy for us, but we can do it. Okay, and that's what he uh, talked about. Now, he also said something really interesting about reason. He felt it was indestructible, that as you aged, you continued to have full powers of the mind, full powers of reason. It might not always look like you do, because your body might fail you, and you can often only communicate reason through your body. Um, but he felt it could be certainly the case that somebody could lose the ability to communicate their reason through the body um, and yet still be there, still be thinking, still be reasoning. Um, a crazy idea. Let's go from that 300 BC to common times and let's watch this real quick. Two decades, Ron Hoopin was misdiagnosed as being in a vegetative state after a car accident. Then doctors discovered through a brain scan that he was conscious and possessed normal brain function. At first, it seemed the 46-year-old Belgian could communicate with tiny movements of his fingers as an aide guided his hand on a keyboard. But experts later disproved that. Doctors say Hoopin has some awareness of self and his surroundings, but cannot communicate. Now research suggests that patients once misdiagnosed as unresponsive, like Hoobin, might someday, with the right tools, be able to communicate directly from the brain. 54 apparently unresponsive patients were placed in MRIs and told to visualize different scenes, playing football or walking through the house. In five of the 54 patients, those scenes activated and lit up separate parts of the brain. One patient went on to correctly answer five out of six yes or no questions about his own life by visualizing football to communicate yes or walking through the house for no. Professor Stephen Lorries of the University of Liège in Belgium is one of the researchers. And then we will be asked a question. We're going to concentrate on this area, which is the motor cortex. So to communicate the yes, the trick is imagine doing your favorite sport. Do you see now clearly? 15 seconds later, the uh, activation in the motor cortex communicating a yes. Laurie says there will be questions for healthcare when technology is developed to enable patients to communicate. Among them, will such patients ultimately be able to direct their own care or choose to end their lives? It opens a new era where I think we need to prepare what we're going to do with this technology. We can ask big questions here. This will have 
major medical, ethical, and legal impact. Another leading researcher, Dr. Nicholas Schiff of New York's Presbyterian Cornell Weill Medical Center, says the study will lead to more accurate diagnoses, identifying unresponsive patients who have the potential to communicate. Whether they then could harness some sort of communication device and establish systematic communication, whether they could then initiate communication, these are all always unknowns. But we found that when patients can do that, it makes a very big difference for them. And at the moment, I think these are gonna be very big healthcare delivery issues. Schiff says the research doesn't apply to people who are brain dead, whose bodies are kept alive by machines, or for those in comas. But the study could offer hope for seemingly unresponsive patients who might one day be able to communicate their thoughts. Carolyn Weaver, VOA News, New York. All right. Cool. So, hey, you know, <laughs> in some cases, it seems like Aristotle, well, at least is right in the sense that you can, we've found cases now where people seem to be unresponsive and they're, they were in the past presumed to be in a vegetative state. But when you show them how to use their imagination to communicate by lighting up certain parts of the brain, they can sometimes show you that they are listening and able to answer questions in a reasoned, reasonable way. Interesting. Let's move on. Other things um, that Aristotle is, is known for, and you know, there's so many, obviously, but um, these are the things that will be relevant to some of the psychology we'll talk about. So first of all, if we just talk about actions, um, because he believed in human reason, he thought that the actions humans are engaging in, they do so because of a reason. You know, there is what he called a final cause. There, there's some goal is what we would sometimes call it currently a goal state. Um, that the reason, you know, you get out of bed and go to university, or in this case, don't go to university, <laughs> go to your computer and watch me, um, is because there's something you're hoping to get out of this. Um, you're hoping it'll lead you to something. Uh, and so he was big on what we might call, you know, goal-directed behavior um, and highlighted that. And he also said, by the way, we have to distinguish between actions and motions. So he thought actions was kind of the, the plan. You want to make something happen. How you actually do that, you know, which muscles, which strategies, which whatever. So the very simple example they give in the textbook is, you know, maybe your goal is to go get the mail. Um, and so you, in, you begin moving towards getting the mail, but there's a number of ways you might do that. Even if we just imagine you, you know, actually in front of the mailbox, do you use your right hand, do you use your left hand, which, which one do you use to, if you have to have a key to open it, how do you do it? So there's all sorts of ways you could choose to get the mail out of the box. And those are your, the motions that accomplish the action. And so the action is a higher order and, and it includes, um, the goal specifically. Now, one of the places this is this really comes into play, of course, is when we get into the behaviorism section, where, of course, um, psychologists started saying, you can't study things, hypothetical things in the mind. All you can study is behavior, what you can actually see, right? What Aristotle might call motion. <laughs> you know, you can study how the animal moves in various um, stimulus context. Uh, but Aristotle said it's not enough to just look at the motion. You also have to get at the reason behind the motion or what is sometimes called the te teleological explanations. What was the goal of the action? And this is the kind of thing behaviors did not want to talk about. Right? They, they, they didn't want to um, think of an animal having a goal. They wanted to see it much more as a reaction to the stimulus. Um, so the animal was just reacting to the stimulus. Now this in fact has, was a bit of a controversial issue in psychology and we will see it come back um, to the point where Skinner in the behaviorist tradition will argue that there is, that the, he will argue against Aristotle. He will actually say, yes, people can tell you why they did something, but they're just justifying their actions after the fact. The real thing pushing them to do something was not some reasoned goal-directed behavior, but rather they were just reflecting how they'd been rewarded and punished in the past. And these stories we tell ourselves about why we did things, Skinner says, are epiphenomenal. That is, we have this conscious experience and we tell ourselves these stories, but they don't actually affect our behavior. 
They're just stories we tell ourselves to explain our behavior to ourselves after we behave. Um, and so he basically threw out this whole idea of, of goal-directed behavior at all. Um, that's how problematic it was for, for uh, the behaviorists to, to have to deal with. Okay, so that's kind of cool. That's Aristotle sort of throwing that out. Uh, Aristotle also began talking about memory, and when he did, he focused a lot on the role of association. And as you will see, association theories, association-based theories in psychology are everywhere. Uh, and so he really originated some of this thought. And so he would say things like, how do I come to remember something? How does something from the past come back into my mind? And he said, well, here's three examples I can give you that are all similarity. Like maybe I see something now that reminds me of something from the past. It resembles it. It looks like it. So I see a dog, and that reminds me of my dog. Um, and I wonder what my dog is doing. Uh, so resemblance might be one way in which a current stimulus pulls a past stimulus back into your mind, right? So too can contrast. He said sometimes opposites. If I say to you, salt you might suddenly think pepper. I don't know, is pepper an opposite of salt? No, that's more contiguity. Um, so let me say black, and you might say white. So that's more of an opposite. Cold, you might say hot. Um, and so sometimes it can be the opposite of something that brings that something to mind. Um, and he called that contrast. And then finally, contiguity is just if things tend to come together because they've experienced together in the past. So salt and pepper would be a case like that. Um, dog and bone, maybe. So you see, you know, dog and you think of bone. Um, so that sort of association, because these things have been together in the past, um, then when you see one of them, it can bring the other one back out of memory. Okay. So those were some of his particular ideas. But again, the, the really kind of critical point I want you guys to take from this is he really started to think about stimuli being connected in some way, associated, and that those connections could play a big role in, in the uh, power of one stimulus to kind of um, summon another one, uh, as it were. And you're going to see that notion replayed uh, over and over. The textbook then goes on to talk about um, mnemonics. And some of you guys may remember in Intro Psych when I did this list of, of 18 words that I associated with my morning routine. And we always have a lot of fun in Intro Psych with that one. Um, I was going to do it again, but we won't do it again here. Uh, but that was what's called a mnemonic strategy, and we talked about it a bit then. Um, how to use things like association to preload your memory so that you can remember things better. So mnemonic strategies are strategies that help you remember things better. Um, so check out that section. It's kind of cool. Again, I think it'll be familiar to you from intro, um, and it's a fun thing to read. So I'm just going to let you let you read that one. Okay, I am going to move on to the next, a Averroes. So this is something sort of, let's just look at time here. So we had Aristotle, you know, way before Christ. Um, and then there was all this conflict in the world. And at some point, uh, the Saracens had the, the area, you know, occupied a lot of the area where Aristotle had been. In it. And in fact, um, a lot of Aristotle's works did not get out to the Western world. Um, but did become known to the Muslim world. And Averroes was in Spain. He was um, an Islamic scholar in, in Spain, um, the greatest Arist Aristotelian uh, of Islam is his title. He's been given this somehow. Um, so he read a lot of Aristotle and he liked it. So first of all, he kind of wrote a lot about it. And a lot of his writings were discovered uh, after, well, uh, after the, the Christians basically took over a lot of that area again. So um, they discovered his works, which were a reflection of Aristotle. And so to some extent, he was the bridge to Aristotle to the Western world. Um, but he didn't just you know, talk about what Aristotle had said. He took some of those Aristotel Aristotelian concepts and kind of built upon them. One example that he's often noted for is with respect to this notion of potential versus actuality. So Aristotle had just sort of um, cavalierly and without, without a whole lot more to say about it, talked about the fact that there's the, things can have a potential to occur, and that potential can be almost unlimited, but only certain things do occur. So only certain things that have the potential to happen, happen, 
or they have their potential um, actualized so they actually happen so you know one example I, I I could just say you know from this point there are there are many potential thoughts that you could have after what I just said so there are all these thoughts that have the potential to occur but ultimately you'll only have a thought or certain thoughts those are the ones that actually occur and so Aristotle just kind of left it there, um, just this distinction between potentiality and actuality. Um, Averroes really um, thought about this in the context of one's intellectual potential. Um, and he actually believed that every human being begins with the same intellectual potential. Um, that anybody could you know, have the power to be an extremely knowledgeable, wise person. Uh, however, we have to use what he called our active intellect to make the potentially knowable actually knowable. You have to actually do something. You have to get engaged to transform potential um, knowledge, in his case, into actual knowledge. I mean, I'll just give you an example of this that I believe, and, and some of you have seen this play out. You know, when I was 30 plus years old, I always wanted to play guitar and be in a band, sort of. Not, I never enough to actually do it. Did I have the potential to do it? Yes, I had the potential to do it, but I hadn't done it for three decades. You know, I just. Psh. But at some point, um, we started actively. I say we because my wife and I started together. We started actively learning um, how, what music is about and how it happens. So let's consider music uh, a knowledge base. And you know we had just a very general knowledge base, especially playing music, producing music. But once you actively engage and start thinking it through and doing things, now these things that you had the potential to do, like sing or play guitar or whatever, you can transform into the actual ability to do it, the actual possession of that knowledge. Um, and so, you know, from Avros's perspective, it's like everybody. And, and by the way, he didn't say every man. Um, he didn't say every Muslim. He said everyone, man, woman, child, everyone has the same intellectual potential, which is a nice egalitarian perspective. Um, and, you know, we hear this sort of notion thrown out there when we, when we hear arguments about the need to make education accessible to all because the argument there is there's a lot of people who if they were given the ability and uh, the access to education could live up to their potential right could show you what they can do uh, but if you don't give them that formal training if you don't engage their active intellect they're not going to be able to rise to their potential so if we you know really want um, some some group or whatnot to increase what they're able to do, we have to make education available as broadly as possible. Um, for example, you often see that women in many cultures are denied education as though they don't have the same potential um, to, to use it as men might in that culture. And then we see an active argument against that that says, oh no, <laughs> you know, if, if the best thing we can do is educate our young girls. Uh, and you know, let them reach their potential and show society what they can do. That's the sort of Avros kind of uh, vibe there. Okay, so now Avros. Now we're into you know the almost the 1200s here. Um, still a long, long time ago, but you're getting a sense. But this will bring us to Thomas Aquinas. So Aquinas um, sort of follows up from Averroes, and you see he's just not much uh, after him. Um, read a lot, learned a lot about Aristotle through Averroes. Um, and I'm going to highlight what they highlight in the textbook. Again, I'll stick to it pretty close. One way in which Aquinas, so Aquinas was this kind of interesting guy. So almost like, let me go back to Averroes, because I don't think I, I highlighted this. Averroes really wanted to demonstrate that religious and philosophical thought are compatible, that they're not enemies in any way. Uh, and Aquinas really adopted that mindset as well. So he was a very scientific, philosophical thinker, but he was a Christian. And, and so he would try to connect these, these two worlds, and he did not see them as incompatible. Uh, so 
some I, th this will give you a sense of how he kind of did that. So he came up with something called the Scala Nature. Um, it's it's or the Great Chain of Being. It's really an extension of Aristotle's ideas on plants, animals, and humans that I talked to you about earlier. But it's a much more qualitative treatment of it, a much more continuous treatment of it. So the notion that Thomas Aquinas has is you could take every creature on the planet and organize them in a hierarchy. And humans would be on the top of the earthly hierarchy, but even above humans, there could be angels. And then at the very top, of course, is God. Um, but he thought, you know, if, it's, if we think of humans as the sort of top of the earthly beings, that you could now have a, a hierarchy where you might imagine great apes or whales or something, and you might get down to the lowliest critter on earth. What is that lowliest critter? I don't know. But in between, you have this great chain of being, a great chain of, of beasts that goes from, you know, little plants up to up to animals, up to humans, and then we have angels and, and God, etc. Um, this notion is, is remains common. You know, we, 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 we still, and it, it frustrates me, to be honest, because I don't believe in it. <laughs> I, I don't believe in it. Um, I, I'm, I am one who feels that, every living creature that can feel pain and suffering um, is equal in, in this world to some extent. Not equal in the sense that they should all have equal rights or full human rights, but they shouldn't be seen as lesser. Um, they should only, in my mind, be seen as different, different forms of life, but not to Aquinas. To Aquinas, there was greater and lesser, more godlike and less godlike forms of life. Um, and, you know, his thinking really, the, the one place I see it so strongly uh, is, again, you know, one of my favorite issues, this, this distinction we have where we say, okay, there are things you can do to animals in a research setting, but if you did that to a human, we'd consider it unethical. Why? You know, why, why is it ethical to cut out a part of a dog's brain, but unethical to do that to a human? Well, in Aquinas' notion, it's because humans are much more godlike than animals are. That, that that animal is much lower on the great chain of being. Uh, it's not as worthy of a life form. It's not as good of a life form as humans, which are much higher on that great chain of being. Um, and that's the sort of logic, you know, if you push a scientist, if you push a neuroscientist, why is it okay to do something to animals that you don't do to humans? They have trouble answering it, but ultimately they have an Aquinas-like view uh, in behind there. There's, they think there's some reason why humans deserve a higher ethical standard. Um, I don't know what that is. You know, uh, you know why, why do we deserve it, a better one? But this sort of no notion resonates, as you'll see. It continues to be relevant and, and continues to affect the way a lot of people think about a lot of things. Okay, so this is the end of chapter two and module two, and I'm gonna try to include more things like this um, to make it clear um, so that you have a good sense of where we are. Um, and I also hope to have all these module uh, headings labeled by the chapters um, they represent by later today, so hopefully you'll see that. Okay, Whew. going a little bigger for a second here. That's week one. Okay, and again, just to make sure you're kind of on track with how the course is going to go, for many weeks, it'll happen just like this did. You will watch a set of lectures, in this case four, um, and then by the Friday of that week, uh, you will have a quiz available on the information that you've been learning in the textbook and in the lectures. Um, and you'll have from Friday to Wednesday uh, to write that quiz. Um, and then, you know, start the next week is the next module and there'll be more lectures. Uh, occasionally, in some weeks, you'll see that we have a peer scholar activity um, or something like that going on as well. Um, so there's going to be a couple of those through the term, as you know. Uh, but that won't happen for a little bit yet. That won't happen until about week five, I think, or something like that. So for the next couple of weeks, we're just going to continue on like this. So if you've read your textbook and you've watched these lectures and then you go do that quiz, that's the vibe. Um, we're going to do that over and over and over. Cool. Excellent. I hope you guys are enjoying things so far. I look forward to continuing this with you. I will see you next time. Alrighty. Bye-bye.